Hey, hey guys, welcome back. Today we're gonna to talk about tool engagement angles. Over the last year, I cut a tremendous amount of steel in the X7, way more steel than aluminum. Lots of different, lots of different steels. A36, 1018, quite a bit of P20 because that's what we make mold cavities out of here at the business. Every time I post a video, inevitably there's someone that asks for the feeds and speeds and I'm a little reluctant to give them because every cutting environment's a little bit different. But I wanna say this, your tool engagement angle is a big deal. And so that's why we're making a video about it here today. It controls how much force is generated and which direction those forces are directed when you're taking your cuts. And it's a big deal. And there are certain types of end mills and certain types of cuts that are more forgiving that allow for a wider range of feeds and speeds. And there are certain types of end mills and certain types of cuts that are really unforgiving. And you gotta get it just right or you're gonna get some chatter. So with that said, let's get into the video. Welcome back guys. Today we're going to talk about tool engagement angles. This is a topic that probably is much, much deeper than we're going to cover here today, but I wanted to give you guys some of the fundamentals because I think it'll help you make better parts. And I think that as you start to understand more of the theory behind what you're doing, it gives you better insight into future decisions. The X7 has turned out to be a really good machine for me, uh, rigid, um, accurate, repeatable, but like any other machine, small or large, it has its limitations. And finding the machine's limitations and being able to work up to them or near them or knowing when you're going to exceed them is pretty critical. And so today, today I'm going to talk to you guys about tool engagement. And so we're going to talk about two, two fundamental components to tool engagement. One, we're going to talk about the tool engagement angle, so we'll call it TEA. And two, we're just going to... For lack of a better term, we'll just call it flute or tool engagement. And this is total engagement, okay? Pull this down so you guys can see. So basically, uh, let's talk about tool engagement angle real briefly. You remember when you were a kid and you were standing, uh, you know, you were standing on the shore near a local pond and here's the water here. That's my that's my water. Don't judge me. And here you were, little version of you. And you were going to throw a rock and you were going to skip a rock off this water. And inevitably what would happen is you'd take this little rock that you had in your hand and you'd throw it down towards the water and if you th if this angle right here was too steep the rock would just, it would go into the water, make a splash, and it would plummet to the bottom. But if you took that rock and you threw it at just the right angle, and the rock was just flat enough, you would then get this skipping effect, right? And so I think this one concept is really important to understand because this situation ends up in a clean cut and this situation over here ends up in incredible, incredibly problematic chatter. And so we'll talk about both of these uh, ideas here in a second. I actually printed out uh, some pieces, which I'm gonna show you guys after I covered this little PDF that I found on online. So this is what I wanna talk about. So this is tool engagement angle. We'll talk about the flute engagement you know, I guess, why don't we do that real quick right now, just to give you guys a quick, quick overview. So basically, you have your, well, we're gonna put two end mills next to each other. All right. Now let's just say that hypothetically, well, actually let's do three, because we'll do a high helix too. So these are all roughly supposed to be the same size, but I guess my art skills are sucking today. So anyways, let's just say that this is a, a three flute end mill. So it looks something like this. One, two, and then let's just say this is the third one over here. And let's just say that this is the exact same, end, same helix angle, but let's just say that it's like a, I don't know, a many more flute end mill. Like one of these seven or 11s or whatever. And then this one is one of those really high, high helix where it's got a really steep angle. I know I'm drawing straight lines. Um, 
here's what I want you guys to understand that there's a variety of there are a variety of situations where uh, there's a lot go there's a lot going on here. I mean, are we touching? Are we actually cutting the bottom of the material and the shoulder at the same time? Because that can, can you know let's just call this C1 and C2, so condition one and condition two, if these are both met, you're gonna introduce more deflection, more force. Ultimately, CNC machining is just an exercise in physics pretty much every day. But the reason I brought up these three end mills, because I wanted to show you guys something. Let's just say that the end mill is cutting down a surface. Let's just say that, let's just say that we're cutting down a surface like this. Just like this, because this is what, I, what I'm going to show you here in a little bit. And let's just say that this is the end mill. This area here is your tool engagement. And so on this, on these end mills, there's two ways to look at this in my opinion. You can either A, draw a straight line down the center of the tool and you can count the number of flutes that are engaged in that line. And so it's almost one in this tool, right? We, we miss this first one, we catch the second one wholeheartedly, and maybe we catch the second one, and there's only a little bit in, in, this, in this tool here. In the second tool, we have a gang of engagement. I mean, we've got a gang of engagement. And then in this last tool, it's something similar. There's a, a whole bunch of flutes engaged. I'm not going to cover why you would choose each end mill right now uh, in this video because I think that there are probably PhD level dissertations that are written on this topic that are far more informed than I am. But I can tell you that if you choose a tool, let's just call this, you know, I think we called this a three fluid or four fluid. I don't remember what we called it in the video. This generates lower tool pressure. And so what happens is it has a wider window for your machine to operate as far as feeds and speeds. And if I can explain that to you, what it basically means is that, I'll use a black marker. This, let's just say this, this tool with less flute engagement, you might be able to run this from, it, this thing might sound great from 200 surface feet to 400 surface feet and 001 chip load to 003 chip load, no problem. All day you could run it this way. This one, this one's got to be ran at 255 surface feet and 0 0.0018 inch per, inch per tooth. Anything more or less in the surface footage and or the chip load, she's going to chatter like a monster. Keep in mind, I didn't give you guys width the cut or depth the cut, but we'll just assume that we're taking the same cut with each end mill, and this is all theory. And then this one, probably similar, but not as bad because of the high, high helix. So I probably should have put these in a different order, but you get the idea. This one is makes for a very forgiving cutting environment, if you're new. This one is completely unforgiving, and then this one is somewhere, you know, we'll just say M for in between. So I know this might be a little boring, but it's super important and it can really change your ability to make good parts and understand why the guy on YouTube's machine sounds super good or his cut sounds really clean and yours, yours doesn't. So, uh, and this goes for any machine. I think it's more critical for machines like the X7. The, uh, the X7 has a few really nice attributes. Uh, it's, they make it with quality parts, which I really, which I really appreciate. It's got the epoxy granite casting, which uh, is super nice, but it's still a small machine, and it's important to understand that. And it's a BT thirty taper, and so I really don't think there was an old saying in the hot rod industry: "There's no replacement for displacement." And what that means is that your three hundred two Mustang, it might be pretty fast, and it might make pretty good horsepower, but compared to a, I don't know, you know, Chevy, four, a big block 454, uh, there's just no replacement for displacement. So in the machine tool industry, there's no replacement for uh, mass, I don't think. 
You can engineer it as good as you want, but you still need a fair bit of mass to create rigidity and uh, dampening. So, All right, so that's that. That's the written portion today. Let's talk about this. This is a diagram that I found. Oops. This is a diagram that I found online. And you can, you can do a web search for tool engagement angle. And this is a PDF that's offered by Macintosh Tool. And I would highly encourage you guys to go get this. In fact, I'm going to link to this in the bottom of this video. Because it teaches us so much. And after I cover this, we'll, we'll grab out the, uh, the, th the 3D printed tools that I showed you guys a little bit earlier. But really what it's showing you guys is that as your cutter travels through your material, there's an interesting relationship that occurs. So obviously when this is like a 50% step over, you've got all this cord length that's traveling through the material. And as it gets thinner and thinner, it gets less and less. But the important thing, the important takeaway, I think right here, really isn't just this black segment. It's the angle, let's just say between the, it's the angle between where the part goes tangent and this. So it's this angle here, this angle here, and then right here, and this angle here. And you can see that we get progressively shallower in our, let's just call it angle of attack or our tool engagement angle. This thing also does a really good, this, this sheet does a really good job of a couple of other things. It does a good, it shows a good example of this relationship between an inside radius on your part versus your tool diameter. And you can see that as you come across this inside radius, your engagement increases, which means your tool load increases. As you come out onto a flat, it goes back to what, maybe what it was programmed at. And then as it goes around an outside corner, it reduces uh, kind of like an inverse relationship here and here. Last but not least is chip thinning. And this is something that's that's really, uh, I, think it, I think this trips a lot of people up. I know that it took me a little while to kind of get my head around it. But when you're climb cutting, the chip starts out thicker and ends up thinner. So I'm going to zoom in even more on this particular spot right here. So your chip load means that your cutter is moving in this direction uh, per flute. So two thousandths per flute, you know, uh, 0 0.001 would be, you know, one thousandth forward every time a new cutting edge is introduced to the surface, which is roughly about 0 0.02 millimeters for you metric guys. But you see that your, your chip starts out thicker and then it gets thinner. And this exact condition uh, is a little tricky because as you take shallower and shallower radial widths of cut, you really need to increase your chip load substantially uh, so that you're not rubbing. And uh, there's a pretty good formula right here that you guys should check out. And so this, this sheet in general is really, this, this I'm, I'm thankful that the internet offers stuff like this. So thank you to Macintosh Tool for a quick breakdown. And now here, let's dump some of this stuff out and we'll cover this real quick, kind of theoretically so you guys can Hopefully I can just drive this home as much as I possibly can. I printed two of each of these, and I think I'm just gonna go ahead and zoom in one more time. We'll try and do this. And we'll see if this works. That might be a little bit tight. Okay, so in this condition, if you're using, this is a one inch cutter. If you're coming along here, we're, just, we're gonna leave it here. We're not even gonna talk about movement. You can see right here that the tool engagement angle the tool's engaged from this leading edge down here, just like we just showed in the book. If for some reason this were an inside corner, let's just say you were doing a 2D contour, you'd be coming in here and you'd be barely, you'd just be barely breathing on this surface. You know, there's only a few thousands left to take off. And then as you came into this corner to make this corner, if this were a square inside pocket, your tool engagement angle would spike. And so I guess what I'm saying is, 
if you had to measure tool load, we'll make this a little graph. If the tool's going along, it's fine. And then when it hits that inside corner, the tool load is just gonna spike. And when the tool load spikes, things happen. When the tool load spikes, the spindle is likely to dip down or flex down towards the floor of the part. So if you're not touching the floor, let's just say you're trying to stand off the floor by a few ten thousandths, you could end up having a perfectly clean floor in this segment here. But as soon as this cutter reaches this you know, equally sized radius, all of a sudden it, the tool engagement angle spikes, the tool load spikes, and boom, it kind of pulls the cutter down and now it kind of puts swirl marks on the floor. And so this is pretty important to understand. So I think, I think the Macintosh tool uh, chart, tool engagement angle chart, did a pretty good job of explaining what we were trying to do. And the same, this is the same thing for a, uh, I think like a half inch cutter. I don't know what size I designed this at, but. So if you were gonna cut something, this is a one inch diameter, so a half inch radius. The, what would be ideal would be to use a smaller cutter that way you get an increase in tool load, but it doesn't skyrocket. It just goes up, you know, by, I don't know, 20%, 30%. It doesesn't go to like, you know, two or 300% more than what you were doing when you were taking your contour. Okay, well, that's about it for tool engagement angles. There are a few key points I wish I would have explained a little more clearly or concisely, but we'll do that in another video at another day. I hope you guys learned something from this video. I, heard, I hope you got some benefits out of it. I want to take a minute and say thank you to each and every one of you that watch. Of course, I want to say thank you to Soil America because without their support, it would be incredibly difficult to take the time and energy and material to make videos like this. And of course, last but definitely not least, my patrons. I know I don't have a lot of you, and I don't know I don't even bring Patreon up that much, but I've made a commitment to myself and to you guys to start putting more content on Patreon. I don't think we'll exactly paywall it, but... Maybe we'll put some stuff on there to reward the people that have been so loyal and so supportive for so long. So thank you guys so very much. Again, can't say thanks enough, and we will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.